Welcome to the third and final part of the procedural dungeon generation tutorial for Godot 3. In this one we're going to wrap up and actually make our explorable dungeon that we can wander around in and has rooms and corridors all connected together. So we have our dungeon rooms and pathway getting generated. This is going to be the last step where we need to turn this into a tile map that we can walk around on. So we're going to use a tile map node. We're going to add that to the main. And what we need to do the tile map is we need to set the cell size to 32 by 32 because that's the size of the tiles we're using. And in the downloads you can go and grab the tiles resource and drop that into tile set. It's a really simple tile set that just has two tiles in it. A grass tile and a stone tile. The stone is going to be the walls and the grass is walkable. If you want to use your own tiles that's fine. You really just need to uh, make the first tile, tile number zero, the walkable tile and tile number one the tile with the collision shape on it. So let's erase that and we're ready to go. Now since we have the visualization running of the room spreading out and the path being drawn, I want to keep that. We're going to manually trigger making the map. So here in our input, we're going to add a new event. And we're going to say uh, press the tab key. And pressing the tab key is, uh, let's see, it's UI focus next is the tab key. We're going to call make map with that. And that's going to generate our tile map. So let's put that, we can actually collapse find MST. Uh, we'll probably need some, do some drawing later, but I'm going to collapse that for now. Make rooms is good. Okay. So let's define make map. So this is the this is the function that's going to create a tile map from the generated rooms and path. So we'll start with map.clear. And what that does, that's a tile map node. Oh, also, I'm going to go up here to the top and I'm going to add a reference to the map just so that I don't have to type dollar sign tile map and have it do a lookup every time I want to access the tile map node. And so calling clear is going to erase any tiles that exist. So that if we're regenerating this, we clear it out first. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take this area that it generated. We're going to make this fill this whole area in with solid tiles. So we're, all, we're going to set them all to tile number one and then carve out the rooms and path with the walkable tiles, tile number zero. So first we need to figure out how big is the rectangle that encloses all of the rooms we make. And then fill tile map with walls, then carve empty rooms. So we're going to make a variable called full rect. That's going to be the full rectangle that encloses our entire map. So the easy, easiest way to do that is going to be to use one of the rectangle2 functions called merge. So we're going to loop through all the rooms. And for each one, we're going to get its rectangle. And its rectangle is going to be its position minus Room dot size is the that's the top left, and then the size is going to be room dot. Let's actually do this on the next line, so it's kind of long. And we're going to get the collision shape 2D node, the collision rectangle, and we're going to get its shape extents. And they, remember, the extents are the half width, so we multiply by 2 to get the full width. And that is our 
rectangle shape that describes the room. And then we just take our full rect and we call merge on it. And that creates a rectangle that encloses both of them. Then we loop through to do the next one and the next one and so on. For this full rect, the top left of the map is going to be world to map full rect dot position. So that gives us the top left position of our map in our tile map. And the bottom right is the same for the full rect dot end. So now we have the two corners and we can now loop through all of those and change every tile to tile number one. So we want to go from top left dot x to bottom right dot y, or sorry, bottom right dot x, and then in y, from top left dot y to bottom right dot y, and set set cell x y one. Now we'll have a solid map, and we can even test that out if we run, let it do it, and then press tab. And now we've made a full rectangle. And now we weren't able to see our drawings anymore because the tile map is a child of main, and main is where the drawing is happening. So if you take the tile map node and go down to visibility and click show behind parent, then we'll be able to still see our drawings behind the generated tile map. Now I will point out here, if your map is really, really big, this might take a little bit of time for it to generate. And that might be something you'd have to deal with if you're doing a large map. You could also preset your map to be solid and then you wouldn't have to calculate any of this. You would just carve out the bits you wanted. It's probably the more efficient way to do it. Um, but for the purposes of our demo, we're fine the way we're doing it right now. Okay, the next step is to carve the rooms and the corridors. So first we'll loop through the rooms and convert their coordinates into map space, and then carve out each rectangle into the grass tiles. So let's go over to our script here, and that's gonna go here right after we've filled it all. We're going to carve the rooms. And so what we're going to do is loop through the rooms. And for each room, we need the to get the kind of size of the room. And what we're going to do is take the room the room size divide by the tile size. And we're going to take the floor of that so that we get a whole number. You can only do tiles in whole numbers. The position of the room is world to map room dot position. And then the upper left of the of the particular room we're on is room dot position divided by tile size. dot floor uh, minus s. So remember the room dot position is actually the center of the room. So this is the center of the room in tile space and then we back to the left and up by the size. So now we can loop through these for x in range 2 s dot x times 2 minus 1 and y in range the same for the y. And so why am I doing that? Why am I not starting at 0? Because I want to leave a little bit of room between the rooms. Where the collision shapes separate them until so that the rooms are all touching. 
So when I carve them out, I want to carve out the inside a little bit so that two adjacent rooms will still have a wall between them and it wouldn't be carved into one big empty space. So now we can set cell uh, ul dot x plus x ul dot y plus y to zero. And now when we run this, we should see it carving out our rooms. So we press tab and now we have rooms carved out everywhere we collected a room. So now we need to do the same thing using the path a star node that we have that connects the rooms. So everywhere there's a connection, say between this room and this room, we need to carve a path between these two points. So since we're already looping through the rooms and going room by room, we can do that uh, in the same room loop. So what we're going to do is before we start, we're going to make a variable. So I want to keep track of which corridors I've already done because I don't want to have to carve the same corridor twice. So I, I only want to carve, here I'll run this again so that we have a picture to look at. So I'm looping through the rooms. When I carve out this room, I want to carve this corridor. When I carve out this room, I don't want to have to carve this corridor again. So, because if I did, then not only am I doing everything twice, but I might wind up with uh, carving, you know, you'll, as you'll see later, say connecting these two rooms, I could go this way and then up, or I could go this way and then down. And if I carve twice, I might carve both of those, and then I've got double the connections. So this will be uh, one quarter per connection. So after we've carved the room, we will carve the connection. And we're going to do that by getting by using our path and getting the closest point to the position that we that the room is at. So remember the path uses vector threes. So we have to do room dot position x room dot position y zero and then for and then for each connection i'm going to abbreviate to connection to con path dot get point connection p connections p All right because each room might have more than one room that it connects to so we need to connect carve each of those connections so if not con in corridors as long as we haven't already done it then we'll do it. And then we need to figure out the start point and the end point. So the start point is got to convert to map space vector to get point position p dot x I just noticed that I missed. And again, this is because of the fact that it's going path.get point position is going to return a vector three. So path.get point position dot y. And then end is going to be the same thing except with the connection. So we can copy this line and duplicate it. And the end point of our corridor is the same thing except with whichever that connecting point is. And once I have the start and the end, I can carve a path from start to end. And now that I've done it, now that I've done that connection, I can say corridors dot append that point. So now that point won't ever get carved from again because I've done all the connections. 
So now we need to just define this carve path function. Carve path. This carves any path from position one to position two in the map. I'm going to get some blank space here. So first, so this function does is carve a path between two points. And this is pretty straightforward. We just need to figure out whether we're going in the X, are we going to the right or the left? And in the Y, are we going up or down? So the X difference is the sign of position two dot X minus position one dot X, right? Is that sign will return positive or negative. And same thing with the Y. So now this way we know what direction we need to carve in. And then the only issue we're going to have here, because we're going to use this to do a loop, right? And either count from X going upwards or count from X going downwards. But we do need to deal with the fact that if pos X, pos two minus pos one is zero, because they're on the same, you know, they're vertically aligned or they're horizontal, horizontally aligned, we can say if X diff equals zero, then let's just pick a random one. And to pick a random number, to pick either random negative one or positive one, we take zero, negative one and we round it to a random integer from zero to one. Right, because negative one to the zero power is one and negative one to the one power is negative one. So we just do that with both x and y. And this is also going to help us with something that we're going to do in a minute as well. So you'll see why we did that if it doesn't seem necessary yet. So now our choice is we need to decide whether we go. So now we need to decide whether we go, for example, let's say we're looking at these two rooms on the right. We could carve in the X this way and in the Y upwards, or we could carve in the Y upwards and then the X this way, right? So whichever one we decide should the, you know, should the horizontal portion be at the lower Y coordinate or the upper one and vice versa. So we can choose that randomly so that sometimes it'll choose to go this way and sometimes it'll choose to go that way. So we'll do that here by saying, so this is choose, uh, we'll choose to either do um, X and then Y or Y and then X. So X, Y, and then Y, X equals pause two. So this is going to be the one option. And then if rand i percent two equal, is greater than zero, right? Then we have a 50, 50 chance of doing the opposite. So now we know, so now we've chosen to either do the X first or the Y first, and then we can do the loops. So first we'll do the horizontal one. So we're going to go from position one dot X to position two dot X by the X difference. And we set cell X and then X Y dot Y comma zero. And then we do for Y in range pause one dot Y plus two dot Y by the Y diff map dot set cell uh, y x dot x comma y zero. Now we're almost there, but let's take a look at what this does. When we hit it, you see we've got some quarters now. But the one thing I don't like about these quarters is they are they're only one tile wide, which means that they're going to be really narrow. And I'd prefer if they were, if we also went one 
to the right or the left or the top or the bottom to make them two tiles wide. And that's why we used this, because we can just add this value to increase or decrease the x and y and make them carve the second tile or the second uh, adjacent tile. So we'll also set cell x and xy dot y plus the y difference. This is to widen the corridor. And we got to do that in both. Okay, and then now we will have wider corridors. There we go. So see this one, these are two tiles wide. And also you'll notice if I press tab and have it recarve, right, it's choosing randomly, seems sometimes to go one way and sometimes go the other, but we always get every room connected. And then we get some interesting intersections too when they overlap like this one. So we can even get a little T-junction there. Okay, so it's about time to wrap this up. So I included in the starter project a character scene that's a uh, top-down character that you can control with the arrow keys that use kinematic body that uses move and slide so that it will collide with the walls. And then I've also added a start room and an end room variable so we know where the player should start and where the player's goal should be. We're going to keep track of whether we're in play mode, meaning we're, are we walking around on the map or not, or are we looking at it generate. And then the player itself will be instanced when we transition into play mode. So a couple things here in draw. I loaded a font here, and I'm just going to label the start room and the end room if they exist. And if it's play mode, I'm going to drop out of draw and not draw the rooms in the path anymore. So we don't need those when we're in play mode. And then in the input, what I've done is when you press the space bar, because you want to restart and generate a new map, we're going to delete the player and drop out of play mode. And we're going to clear out the start room and end room as well. And how do you go into play mode? Well, we're going to press escape. And that's going to instance the player and put it in the start room. And that means that now when we run it, we're going to generate our path. We're going to press tab and generate the tile map, which we can see. And then we're going to press escape, and we have our player here. And the player also has a camera that zooms in and out if you want to see more of the map. But now I can walk around the map and find my way to the end room wherever it was, which is probably going to be far away from me on this one. I believe it was way over here to the right. Because the start and end functions are just finding the leftmost room to be the start room and the rightmost room to be the end room. However, that winds up working. All right, and so that is our randomly generated dungeon. Now, obviously, the dungeon itself is pretty boring. It's kind of plain. Uh, decorating the dungeon and populating it with treasure, monsters, and things like that is beyond the scope of this demo, but it will probably make for a really good future one. So if you have thoughts and suggestions on that, please leave them in the comments below. Hopefully, this these algorithms and this procedure is useful to you in generating your own dungeons or at least giving you a starting point to think about how you want to do it for your particular project. Either way, I look forward to hearing about your questions and comments below, and I will see you in the next lesson.